let me introduce Greg Gibson to you. Greg, uh, the way that I know Greg is he was at one point my neighbor. That's how we met. I lived on Best Road, and Greg moved in next door. He was uh, working with the youth at Foothills Church at the time and has since done a lot of different things. But uh, the, when I first met him, he worked there at Foothills Church, worked with their youth there. And uh, he had great, he was married to Grace. He, Cora was born, I think Ivor was born while you lived there, maybe. I, he, was, he was very young. When they moved out from Best Road, he was still a little old bitty feller. Neither one of them were very old, I think now. Cora, I think Cora's taller than Krista. Which, I mean, that ain't saying that much, but still, she is taller than Krista now. They've grown a lot over the years, and I uh, hate, hate Ivers run a fever and couldn't, they couldn't be here, but uh, that, that happens, man. It's part of having kids. But uh, Greg, at that time, was working at Foothills. He went on then to, to plant churches, planted a church in Washington, D.C. there, and they lived there for several years. Came back and helped Foothills Church plant a church over in Bearden. And uh, so, I, the, they, is that the Bearden campus? Do they have a name for that yet, or is it just the Foothills Bearden or something like that? Okay, all right. So he helped plant a church there. If you know where the Dollar Movies, if you know where that used to be, that's now, uh, or at least going to be, Foothills Church over in uh, Bearden. So we're grateful for that too. Glad to have a good church in that area. Uh, and then uh, Greg has most recently been working in Ukraine, and was initially working with sought Ukraine to train pastors there, but because of the war, I think there's been also, a, I think, a lot of maybe humanitarian efforts as much as there has been training pastors at this point, but he may want to tell you a little bit more about salt and what he does in Ukraine. But ever since I've ever known Greg, he's always been, uh, all, I've, I've, two things about him, always encouraging, always positive, always upbeat and uplifting. It, it was always good to talk to Greg. You walk away feeling better when you talk to him. And the other thing is, and the most important thing is, it's always been evident to me from the time I first met him until now that Greg loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And I'm going to tell you something. Of all the things you can say about somebody, especially somebody that's going to stand up and preach, the best thing you can say about anybody is they love Jesus. Amen. Everybody ought to know Jesus. Everybody ought to love him. And I love people that love Jesus. And I love Greg. I'm grateful he's working with a church and helping us out. Grateful he could be here this morning to bring the word of God to us. Greg, you come at this time, brother. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. So as Pastor Scott said, my name is Greg, and it is true, we were neighbors. And, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite stories about being his neighbor is, I think I was maybe 23, 24 at the time, living off a youth pastor's salary, and we had a pretty big yard, and this is before I even knew that you were a pastor. I would come home during spring, or kind of the, the first spring season that we lived there, and the big part of our yard would already be mowed, and I would pull in the driveway thinking, oh, I love Scott so much. <laughs> And finally, finally, we had some time together. You know, who are you? What do you do? He's like, I'm a pastor. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. And I am too. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, brother, it's so great to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I love your pastor, and I love his family, and it's great to just reconnect and, and see you today as well. And, and so we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah this morning, the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to answer two questions. Where am I going and how will I get there? Where am I going and how will I get there? And yes, I'm a father, pa husband, pastor, but mostly church planter. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of my time recently has been spent, really for the last two years, has been spent in Ukraine, going back and forth to Ukraine um, to train pastors to plant churches. And, I mean, since the pandemic started, I've been to Ukraine 12 times. Since the war started, I've been to Ukraine three times. Um, uh, and we've since uh, seen God do a lot of things in the church in Ukraine. Uh, not only are we seeing amazing gospel receptivity, 
right now in a really terrible, tragic place. Uh, but we're also seeing Ukrainians dispersed all over Europe right now. And really, if you pick up a, a rock and throw it, you can plant churches with Ukrainians. Uh, in Warsaw, Poland alone, there's 400,000 Ukrainians. And my daughter, uh, who we already talked about, will be with me in a couple weeks, and we're going to go and, and uh, visit some Ukrainian refugees and, and some pastors who are working to plant churches in Warsaw, Poland, with Ukrainians. And so what I, wanna, what I want you to see from Nehemiah today, I'm, we're, we're going to be in six chapters, and I'm not going to read all six chapters to you this morning. But, but I want you to have your Bible open in front of you. I'm going to give you six principles from the book of Nehemiah, the first six chapters. And, and, and I want you to see what God is doing, not only here at this time in Jerusalem, but I want you to see what God is doing around the world, even now. But I also want you to see what God is doing in you this morning, in your heart. And, and again, I'm going to answer these two questions. Where am I going and how will I get there? And the end of the, 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 the title of the, the sermon this morning is the gospel in Nehemiah. Because then we're going to see how the gospel jumps out of this book and applies directly to our life. So again, question number one, where am I going? Secondly, how will I get there? And I have seen many people have the ability to dream. Right? I've seen many people have the ability to dream, but I've seen over and over again the inability that people have to get to their destination. I think creating vision for your life is a pretty unique thing. It's pretty unique. For one thing, the vision that we have should be aligned with, with God's vision in our life, but on the other hand, each one of us have been uniquely gifted by God and He alone has given us unique experiences that apply directly to us to step forward in faithfulness and participation in what He is doing in the world. And I think this is a unique ability to be strategic, to think strategically about, okay, what's God doing now? What's God doing in my life? And then how is He inviting me to participate in His great story? And I think so often we make decisions in the moment. We make decisions through the, the tyranny of the urgent. And I get emails every week. Um, maybe you do as well, Pastor Scott, that go something like this. Greg, I hope you're doing well. I know that you're busy, but would you have time to connect with me? I don't feel like I have any direction right now in my life. I, I wonder if anyone has ever felt that way. Get, you know, get in line behind me kind of thing. Um, I think you could, you could be experiencing something even amazing in your life. You could have potentially a, a mountaintop moment in your life, um, but without something that's anchoring you or inviting you into something greater than yourself, we could be seeing a pattern where we're going back to a asking the question, well, what is God actually doing in my life? How is he inviting me? to play a part in his amazing story, right, of what he is doing in the world. And, and here's what I know. I think creating vision for your life, uh, on one hand, is the ability to see where you currently are. Okay, here's where I'm at. And it's also being able to put a plan in place for where you're going. But it's also this, and this is what we're going to see in the story of Nehemiah in these six principles from the six chapters. It's also trusting that God is already working and he, and he has you exactly where you need to be right now to participate in what he is doing in the world. And so, so as we talk about this concept of creating vision for our life, we're going to look at potentially one of the greatest leadership stories, lessons even, in all of the Old Testament. And, and because of this content, we're going to learn some, some timely leadership principles from a timely leader. But my hope is that after we're done together, uh, I think the, the, the aroma is, has, already in, has already been set by Pastor Scott that we would leave loving Jesus more this morning. Um, but ultimately, we would see, okay, here, here's some principles from God's Word 
that apply directly to our life now and that move us forward for what God is asking us to do. So let's begin by introducing the man, Nehemiah. Maybe you've read this book a hundred times, maybe even a thousand times, but maybe these are some good reminders for you. Nehemiah was a timeless leader. Some would call this, this man one of the most resilient, inventive, and the largest personalities in all of the Old Testament. So Nehemiah was neither prophet, priest, or king, but he was a dedicated layman. So Nehemiah is the guy who gets here early, right, and he, and he makes sure that the church is open, and he makes sure that the sound is turned on for the worship, and you know, that, hey, you're going to come in, and this is going to be a good experience for everyone. And he's the, ki- he's the guy who's kind of head up on a swivel, looking for things that already should be done, and he's not waiting for someone. He's not waiting for Pastor Scott to say, hey, do this, do that. We need some, some teams over here. We need some volunteers. Nehemiah is the guy who's already thinking four, five, six, seven, eight steps of he- ahead of how he is going to serve. In other words, he's just a A guy, and I use this term in in the best sense that we can use it, he's a normal guy, right, who has a normal job, whose world was disrupted. And one scholar describes Nehemiah this way. He says, a trusted wine steward in a pagan place becomes God's instrument for Israel's renewal. But if we could call him one thing, we're going to call him leader. Okay, six principles from the book of Nehemiah. And again, you can read as I'm kind of sharing about the story, fill in the blanks if you have your Bibles in front of you, and we're going to pull out six principles from six chapters. Principle number one is this, vision is born from burden. Vision is born from burden. So let's look at the text just for a second. the story of Nehemiah is, is an interesting story because here's this guy who's in Susa at the time, and he's outside of the city, and these guys come by, and they tell him what the news of what? That the walls of what city have, have burned down, right? The walls of Jerusalem burned to the ground. And what was Nehemiah's immediate response when he hears this news? He doesn't get mad or angry. He doesn't, he doesn't rally the troops immediately. He doesn't think about a, a way to solve the problem, but what was his immediate response when he heard the news that the walls of Jerusalem had burned to the ground? Verse 4 says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I what? I wept, I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed. And then we see his prayer, and we begin to understand that he is praying immediately for God to give him favor before who? before King Artaxerxes. And this is his prayer from verses 4 really through the end of 11. And then there's one sentence at the end of Nehemiah chapter 1 that's an amazing sentence and we, we, can miss, we could just jump over it if we're not careful. It says, now I was cupbearer to who? I was cupbearer to the king. And I, I, think, I think we can jump into the text and we can see this moment for Nehemiah But I want us to be reminded this morning that every single one of us have what we could call cupbearer to the king moments in our life. Whatever it might be, friends, that God is leading you to do today, I want you to see that the vision for your life or the vision for something that God gives to you is oftentimes born out of a burden that he presents as an experience, maybe even that you go through. What, what was this for Nehemiah? He's outside the city, he hears the news, and, and, and he's broken, right? He spends really three months, we're going to see in chapter two, praying, weeping, mourning, fasting, asking God to give him favor, coming up with the plan, and then this last sentence in chapter 1, now I was cut bare to the king. Vision is born from burden. Vision for something that God gives to us is born from something that God produces in us. Life-changing vision, maybe that God brings before you, that you've never been more excited about in your life. 
is oftentimes born from some kind of experience or some kind of encounter. But here's what I want you to, to see, friends, is that God, like Nehemiah here, has put you exactly where you need to be to, for, for him to carry out his vision in your life right now. Nehemiah was given a vision for what? To rebuild these walls around Jerusalem that was born out of a burden. Our vision for our lives always is born from something that God is doing in us. And so I want you to see where God has placed you right now. Maybe you've been a member of this church longer than I have been alive. Praise God for his faithfulness in your life. Amen. But maybe he's put you right here, right now, for a great purpose. What is that purpose? What is God doing in you and producing in you right now that may be leading you to start something? Be excited about a new small group. Be excited about reaching a neighbor for Christ. Be excited about maybe a new church planted somewhere in your city. Maybe it doesn't have to even be something like that. Maybe it could be uh, something else, right, that God is doing in your life. But here's what I know to be true. Nehemiah was cut bare to the king. So if there was anybody that could do something about the walls of Jerusalem being burned down in chapter 1, who was it? It was Nehemiah. He was cut bare to the king. It's not an accident um, that God moved my family six years ago to Washington, D.C. To, to plant a church one mile from the White House. Um, we, we heard the news, right, the metaphorical news that the wall around the city had burned down. But, but we also heard the news that in the 2000 seven zip code, that there was not one gospel-preaching, Bible-believing church in our nation's capital. Not one. People who live in the city, okay, they were driving to this guy named Mark Devers Church, or they were driving outside of the city, out of the Beltway, to other churches in the suburbs, but in this one zip code, not one. Very, very Catholic, very affluent Jewish uh, in this area, in our nation's capital. And I remember exactly where I was when I heard somebody give me that statistic. And then I remember this kind of like gospel pebble that God put in my shoe. And I, for like three months, I'm kind of walking around with this limp, right? I can't shake this, this thing, this news that I had heard that, are you telling me that in our nation's capital there's not a Bible-believing gospel preaching church? in one of the main zip codes. And so Grace and I prayed. We, we talked with our leadership and authority at our local church. Uh, we began to, the process to be assessed uh, for what it means to be a church planter. And we went through very similar of, of, of what Nehemiah went through. And, and God opened the door to, for us to move our two little kids to, to plant a church out of faithfulness, right? Um, Nehemiah was cut bare to the king. I just so happened to be a youth pastor at Foothills Church, but I was in the right room at the right time to hear the news, and other people around me were like, yeah, okay, I think you're the guy. What is it that God's doing in you? you what cut bare to the king stories do you have in your life in a rearview mirror where God is, you can, you can already throw up your hands and worship and praise and say, this is, this is the stories of God's faithfulness in my life and in my family. But I, but I know that he's not through with me yet. Amen? I know he's not. Friends, he is doing something in your life, even today. And my challenge, even in the beginning of this book, is that, that, that we would, you would be sensitive to that. You would be sensitive to the leading of God, the Holy Spirit, working in your life, and know and believe and trust that he has put you exactly where you are supposed to be today to carry out his vision, not just for your life, but also in what he is doing in and around the world for his glory, his glory. 
oftentimes world-changing vision in our lives is born from world-disrupting burden. World-disrupting burden. Principle number two, after vision is born from burden, what does it need? It needs a plan. And we see this in in chapter two. So if you look with me again at the story, uh, I'll I'll just share it and you can read along and, 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 and piece together some details. But it says this in verse one, in the month of Nisan, that's three months after Nehemiah heard the news, he goes to the king and he presents his plan. The king's Basically says, hey, Nehemiah, you, something's, going on, something's off here. Your face is sad. Your body language is different. You're being passive aggressive. What is happening? And, and, he, and he shares, hey, the, the, the place, my homeland, right, this, the, the wall has, has burned down to the ground. Its gates have been destroyed by fire. And then the king says in verse 4, well, then what are you requesting? Nehemiah then shares with him what he's requesting. The king grants to him his requests. And then in verse 8, I love verse 8, Nehemiah, he, 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 grant, he says this. He says, and the king granted me what I asked for what? The good hand of who was upon me? The good hand of my God was upon me. Here, here's what I know to, to also be true, friends, brothers and sisters. The difference between a dream for your life and a vision for your life is a strategy that you put behind it. The difference between a dream that you have and then a a vision that is born from burden that God allows you to experience or even go through is a strategy that you can put together. Here's here's the greatest enemy for accomplishing your vision. It's today. And you you know what the second greatest enemy is? You'd probably be like, sin, yeah, yeah, of course, that's, that's enemy zero. But tomorrow, and then the next day is the third greatest enemy. And the day after that is the fourth greatest enemy. The greatest enemy for what God is doing in you right now is the tyranny of the urgent. Sometimes, oftentimes, very good things that God gives to us. But if our vision is born out of burden, then our vision needs to move from developing uh, or sitting and praying and, and fasting and mourning, but now to developing a strategic plan for accomplishing this vision that God has given to you. And so Nehemiah, he, he takes off in the end of chapter 2 to Jerusalem, if you remember the story. And, and he, he does three days of reconnaissance in the middle of the night. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. He goes and he surveys and he inspects, and then he gathers the people together after he, he, he sees, he prays, he comes up with a plan, and then what, what was the, the response? He, he's in verse 18, he says, And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And then they said, Oh, we've got too much to do, Nehemiah. Oh, they said, Oh, we've got a lot of emails to send. No, they said, oh, well, well, we've got this, this project already started over here. No, what did they say? They said in verse 18, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. And then chapter 2 ends again, right? The God of heaven, he says, he replies to them, will make us prosper. God of heaven will make us prosper, for the good hand of my God was upon me. If you have a plan for how you're going to accomplish your vision, then I think we're moving in the right direction. God-given vision is born from burden, and it also needs a plan. Principle number three, vision then requires God-given resources. Vision requires God-given resources. Okay, let let me just pause for a moment. When I say resources, what does your mind go to? Probably goes to finances, money, right, capital, loans, I don't know, whatever it might be. And when we read Nehemiah chapter 3, we get to this long list of people that work on the wall. And if you're, if you're like me and you're reading the text and you get to a long list of people, you're like, oh man, this is labor. Now I got to pronounce these names and all right, I'm skipping to chapter 4, right? But th- this, this chapter that we often skip over has a phrase 
in it that I want us to, to draw out. And, and I think it reminds us this, is that the greatest God-given resources are not necessarily finances or money, but the greatest God-given resources are God's people. Because look at chapter 3, okay? You, you can see it everywhere. You can just kind of scan chapter 3. There's a phrase, and next to them. This is the translation of my Bible. And next to them. 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 It's always, brothers and sisters, people, God's people, through which God-given vision is accomplished. God never works apart from his people. People are the conduit that bring about redemption and life change. And the story of Nehemiah, this is exactly what is unfolding. Nehemiah creates the vision, he rallies the people, then he casts the vision, and then it's who that accomplishes the vision. It's the people of God that come together to accomplish the vision. And this phrase, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them, it should excite us. It should excite us. Hey, when, when, I'm, when I'm training pastors, wherever I'm training pastors, even, even in the States, or it doesn't matter, in, in Slavic people groups around the world, uh, I... I, I, am, I am constantly going back to this all the time because they're thinking money, 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 building, 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 money, 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 building, building, building. Yes, those things are great, but we know that the church is the people of God, right? We know that God is, is saving people all over the world, and I am constantly even reminding pastors and leaders at the highest levels that we don't just need resources to participate in what God is doing around the world. God has provided his people. And, and I, I'm always teaching them three things. One, we need a Bible, amen, to plant a church. That's the first thing. We need God's word. We need the gospel. Romans 10, verse 4. How will they call on him who they have not believed? How, how uh, are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So we, we know, check. Okay, we have the scriptures. Secondly, I'm always saying, well, we need a ready leader. We need a ready leader. In the case of church planting, this is a pastor who, who, uh, who sits under these, these prescriptive qualifications from 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5, right? And then a ready team. And I'm always reminding even church planters who are planting churches around Ukraine, this is not a one-man show. You're not a maverick. God works through God's people together. Ministry, whether it's starting small groups or planting churches in Ukraine, is not an individual sport. If we want to play individual sports, let's go be terrible at golf. Amen? But if we want to, if we want to do ministry, it doesn't matter what kind of ministry, then we need to begin to see ministry in the round. God has always called us to be a part of the body of Christ. Yes, he saved us into a relationship with him. Even more so, he brings us into a relationship with one another, right? That's the beauty of how the gospel breaks down barriers and walls, not only gives us salvation because of Christ's righteousness now applied to us, but what he brings us into is a team, a body, and a family. And if we, in fact, this is really all we need for whatever might be. God might be doing even in your life this morning. What is it that God is doing in your life this morning? And next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. I don't know what it is, but God is inviting you, one, to either be a part of a team that is doing good gospel work, or maybe he's inviting you to call a meeting with Pastor Scott and say, hey, here's, here's, here's what God's been doing with me, in, in me for a long time. Would you give me guidance on this group or this evangelistic effort or this ministry or whatever it is that God's doing in you, again, that's born from burden. And next to them, and next to them, and next to them, next to them, we were led in worship, right? Next to them. Our brother played the drums and guitar. And next to them, the beautiful voices that were reminding us of the gospel truths. And next to them, there are people serving 
your children this morning, right, and teaching them these life-changing eternal truths of the gospel. And next to them, there are deacons who head up, right, on a swivel, meeting needs all around us. And next to them, and next to them, and next to them, God is working right here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church, amen? And, and sometimes we can, we can get so caught up in the tyranny of today, the tyranny of tomorrow, and the tyranny of Tuesday, that we forget that his faithfulness is great all around us, even today, through the people of God that he has provided for us. God-given vision is born from burden. God-given vision needs a plan. And God-given vision requires God's greatest resource, which is what? God's people. Principle number four. Principle number four. Vision then overcomes opposition and criticism. Vision overcomes opposition and criticism. And, and if you look with me again at the text, what we see here is that this guy, Sambalot and Tobiah, then are coming into Nehemiah's life. In fact, they actually showed up in chapter 2, but we skipped over that, that part of the story. But they're here, and they're here in force. And now that they've brought more people with them, and they're making fun of Nehemiah, and they're telling him his work is terrible. In fact, they, they even say, hey, this wall that you're building, a fox could stand on it and tear it down, right? So they're kind of making fun of even his craftsmanship. And, 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 and what I see in the life of Nehemiah, and what I see in the life of someone who's been given God-given vision, is that we never respond to criticism with more criticism. And we never respond with getting mad or taking it personally or, or quitting, right, or trying to win them over. What does Nehemiah do here? Let's just take a, a page out of Nehemiah's playbook when the visions that God gives to us are criticized. What does Nehemiah do? He, he, he does what Nehemiah does best. If you go back to chapter 1, he hears, here's the news. As soon as I heard these words, I prayed. He does the same in chapter 4. Here, oh God, we are, and this, this word despised. And he prays not only for his heart, but for those who are criticizing and that the work would continue. And then in verse 6, he says, so we built the wall. What does he do? He prays. Even with the best intentions, even with the best intentions, we could have our visions criticized. Uh, it happens all the time. Like, I mean, b believe it or not, Okay, I, I, um, I lead an organization that works to plant churches around the world. Um, even sometimes that is criticized. Oh, we've got, we've got enough churches. Oh, we've got needs here. We've got stuff going on here. We've got whatever, whatever it might be. It sounds overly simplistic, but I believe it with all my heart. Any vision that God gives you is going to be met with criticism and opposition. Our job, if vision is born from burden... And God's people, right, are providing the yes and the amen. And God seems to be providing his greatest resources. Our job is to simply be faithful and to not quit. And when I talk to, when I talk to, to, to young people all the time, so, um, all right, maybe there's some in the room up here. Uh, but like, 18, 22, you're making some, some pretty life-changing decisions, right? Where should I go to college? If not college, what kind of trade should I have? Who should I marry? Should, should I pursue this person? Should this person who's pursuing me, should I say yes to them? Right? There's, there's lots of, of life-changing decisions that begin to, to unfold. Should I live here? Where should I move? Um, he, here's the grid that I always am going back to in my own heart, and I'm constantly challenging young people and even leaders to go through. And, and the grid for when someone criticizes us, it's very simple, it's very quick, or when someone criticizes our vision that's born from burden, is, is four things quickly. It's what does the Bible say, number one. Number two, have I prayed about this? Number three, what does the authority in my life say? That's important because we don't just want to have rogue visions. Oh, this is what God's doing. This is what God's doing. And then everyone around us is saying, oh, I don't know, you know. What, but what does the authority in my life say? And this is important for when I go back to speaking about 
how to make life-changing decisions for young people. And then number four, what are my desires? And I put desires at the end because if I can get through the first three and still get to my desires, and then Philippians 4, God leads with his peace, is still happening, then I know I can overcome this opposition and criticism. But when I'm met with, with, with confrontation or I'm met with something, okay, maybe this isn't the right decision, maybe I should turn this way or that way, I'm going through that grid. What does the Bible say? Okay, we should plant churches. I think that's pretty clear. Matthew 28, make disciples of what? All nations. Um, have I prayed about it? Yes. Okay. What authority in my life saying? You, you can do this. We're behind you. We're going to send you. We're going to even present or send with you God's greatest resources, which are his people. And then are my desires there? Yes. Great. Is, do I still have a peace? Philippians 4, that surpasses all understanding through all this? Okay. Then I'm going to keep moving forward when I experience, like Nehemiah here, someone saying, even a fox is going to tear down that wall. Even a fox. My encouragement for us is to remember God's faithfulness in us. Principle number five. Vision then creates redemptive movement. Vision then creates redemptive movement. And, and let, me, let me just explain what I mean by this. Because when I, when I talk about this, people are like, I have no idea what, what he's talking about. So, whenever... Someone focus, whenever somebody criticizes the vision that God gives to us, with Nehemiah here, or, or, the, or we have a vision and we're moving forward, and we experience criticism, or we experience opposition, or we experience something else, or a tyranny of the urgent, what is our focus and our posture? Our posture sometimes is to stop what we're doing, pause, and kind of give attention over here. Does that make sense? Or pause and, and then give attention over here. And, and, and what we're doing is we're, stop, we're stopping our own focus that God has given us a vision to do A, B, C, or X, Y, Z, but now that some things are happening that are harder, we're going to turn our attention here, and we're going to turn our attention left, instead of focusing on faithful next step, faithful next step, and keeping the vision that was born in you from burden, front and center. Because when God gives you a world-changing vision, things begin to happen. And this is what we see in Nehemiah chapter 5. The, the redemptive movement was not that he just rebuilt the wall. Do you see this? What happens in chapter 5, if you're, if you're with me still? If you just kind of look, he, he, he's, he's stopping the oppression of the poor. He's been there now for 12 years. And now he's realizing the government officials and the, the high priests and those who are in charge are taxing the people at such high rates that those who are in Jerusalem are having to sell their land and even their own children, the text says, to pay for taxes. So Nehemiah's faithfulness, was, was step one was what? Build the wall. But the redemptive movement or the redemptive things or the life-changing things that happened after that was priceless. He was able, because of his faithfulness, to stop the oppression of the poor, to, to help people get their children back, to help people start using money for good and not greed. When we focus on the redemptive movement of the vision that God gives us, people come to faith, people begin to be baptized, people have their lives changed for better, leaders are developed, churches planted, maybe even small groups are started. People are coming to faith because of those small groups. Who, who knows what stories that we can tell? And that's how I'm always being reminded, even in my own heart, okay, is this the vision that God has given to me? And I can measure it by the stories of God's faithfulness over and over and over and over again. The stories of God's faithfulness. The stories when, when this baptism is full of water and people are, are baptized. That's how you measure what, what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 5. That's how you measure redemptive movement. When, when, when you hear a story of, hey, I'm praying for my neighbor. I, I had an opportunity to share the gospel with this person. That's how you measure redemptive movement. Rebuilding the wall was the only thing, wasn't the only story he could tell now. Stopping oppression, helping families get their children back, using money for good. 
This is how we then are faithful to what God is doing in us. And we're reminded and anchored over and over again about the stories of life change that we get to experience. What God is doing. Maybe it's your own children coming to faith in Christ. Amen? Maybe it's your grandchildren coming to faith in Christ. So I had this vision. This is not as part of my notes, but I had this vision that one day, like 30, 40 years from now, God will allow me in grace to, my wife, to wake up early in the morning and like pour a strong cup of coffee, sit in a rocking chair somewhere. I don't care if it's Ukraine or East Tennessee, but it's going to be a rocking chair and pray for the salvation of our grandchildren. That's redemptive movement. That's God's faithfulness. And I know there's a lot of time between that day and now. I have an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old, right? And there's a lot of time for me to step away or to, to get off track or to make a wrong decision that could ruin it all or to mess it up. But I'm gonna, if, if I'm focused on faithful next step, faithful next step, what God is doing, that maybe I'll have stories and you'll have stories like Nehemiah is sharing here of redemptive movement all over the place. All right, let's wrap this up. Principle number six, finally here. Vision then leaves a kingdom legacy. Leaves a kingdom legacy. We see that the wall was finally finished in chapter six. I love chapter six, but for the sake of time, I'll let you read it on your own. In chapter seven, we see that the exiles are returning. In chapter eight, we see Ezra is reading the law and consecrating the work. And because of this, in, in chapter 8, people are, are gathering and crying out. If you look in, in verse 9 of chapter 8, for the people weep as the words of the law are being read. What a, what a picture. And then in Nehemiah chapter 13, the story of this faithful leader ends. And this is kind of a cupbearer to the king statement at the end in verse 31. His last recorded words, right? Remember me, oh my God, for what? For good. Remember me, oh my God, for good. And so, so my question is, is it wrong to be remembered for good? Brothers and sisters, is it wrong? No, absolutely not. But it's not all the way right either. It's not all the way right either because we know the rest of the story, don't we? We have the rest of the Bible. We have the rest of Jesus' birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection right in front of us. In fact, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, no one is righteous, not even one. We know that God's story doesn't stop in Jerusalem just with the rebuilding of the walls. We know that God does not remember us for our good or anything at all that we could possibly bring before God. But here's what I know this morning, and I know that you know this too. Praise be to God that God doesn't remember us for our good, or he doesn't count us worthy because of our good, or he doesn't count us free even because of our good, or he doesn't give us favor because of our good, or he doesn't even give us salvation in Christ because of our good, or anything that we could put before him. Any gift or life or best day even. But he gives us those things despite our goodness. Despite our best efforts. And only because of what Christ has done for us. And the goodness of Christ. The perfection of Christ. And the grace of Christ now applied to us. That's how God remembers us. In fact, this is God's story. Nehemiah's vision is born from burden. Your and I's vision is born from burden. But God's vision is born from burden. And what's God's vision? For the nations to know him. For his glory to unfold amongst every people group. And it started, yes, right? In Jerusalem with this story. And then to Bethlehem. And we understand this. And we understand that it... Our good is never good enough, and the per perfection of Jesus is applied to us. Then we understand we're invited into this great story. And I, I want you to see this just, just quickly, but Christianity 
This is the only worldview or religion or ideology, whatever you want to call it, relationship. That's what we'll call it, right? That teaches that God's on top of this mountain and that he comes down for us and brings us back up. Every other religion is God on top of this mountain and then you and I, in our best efforts, first switchbacks. All right, I got to have i got to have these things right in my life. Second, switch back. Okay, i got to behave this way. Look this part. Dress this way. Talk this way. Next, switch back. And, and the, the crushing weight of trying to get to the top to God one day and say, and God basically saying, okay, well, why should I let you into glory? And you, and you somehow bring before him your best efforts. But the gospel is reminding us that in his grace, he comes down the mountain for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the only story that I know, true story, at that, that teaches that a king leaves his kingdom and gives his life for the citizens to come back into the kingdom. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that in his grace and in his mercy, he brings us back up this mountain, not in our efforts, but now because of the perfection of Christ then applied to us. That's the beauty of the gospel, is that, that, that Christ takes our sin. God the Father takes our sin and applies it to his son. God the Father takes Jesus' righteousness, this term for perfection, and then applies it to us. And now God sees us not as enemies, his wrath has now been satisfied where? On the cross of Jesus Christ. And now he sees us in the same way, Romans chapter 8, that he sees his own son. In fact, we, not just, we don't just have son and daughter titles, but you and I in Christ now have royalty titles. Co-heir with the king of the universe. And this and when we understand this, and we, and we work hard to understand how Nehemiah created vision and, and how God is calling us to create vision, we, we know that his great story in Christ becomes our great story, and our vision for our life becomes aligned under his vision for our life. The story of Nehemiah began where? In Jerusalem. But the mission of God is that the gospel is going from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and then where? To the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8 promises us this. That the gospel's going forth now from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Yes, it started in Genesis 12 with the, the faith of, of Abraham being considered righteous. Then to, to David in 2 Samuel 7. This Davidic covenant that God made with him. Then to, to this new covenant in Jeremiah 31. That, that no longer you will have hearts of, of stone. But you will have what? Hearts that have been redeemed by the grace of the gospel. Here's my final plea. My final plea is if you work to build a vision for your life, dream as big as you possibly can dream, but never build it apart from what Christ is first doing in you, through you, and to the nations. You have permission to dream, dream big, plan well. See God's people as the greatest resource in your life from a place of grace, yes. Work out of grace and, and keep moving forward to overcome opposition, criticism like Nehemiah here. See redemptive movement in the stories that you can tell all around you, all over you. And then work to leave a kingdom legacy that's not your legacy but it's Christ's legacy through you. And let us build big visions, but let's remember that this, this final point could even be build the vision for your life on what God is doing in the world. Build your vision for your life on what God is doing in the world. This is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Go and make disciples of all what? Nations. This word nation, ethne, this Greek term that means people group, not nations with borders as we have them today. And I, I just want to remind us before we 
we pray and close that, that there are 17,000, this is according to the joshuaproject.net, the Ministry of Frontier Ministries, 17,427 people groups in the world today. That's a lot of people groups. Not nations of borders, people groups. 7,415 are still on use. That means that 42.5%, quick math, of the world is still unreached with the gospel. 7.93 billion people on earth. 3.37 billion of those people who are still unreached, have no access to the gospel. Build big visions for your life, but let's never build them apart from what God is doing in the world for his glory to unfold amongst the nations for the fame of Jesus in all peoples. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the scriptures. We're thankful for your stories to us, your faithfulness to us, that you reveal yourself to us in your authoritative and infallible word. And we stand here this morning and we we acknowledge that first, that your word is true and that your gospel is good news and the grave is empty. And you've called us into something greater than just ourselves. You've given us a salvation in your son, Jesus. You've defeated the greatest enemies in our life of sin and death because of what your son has done. And Father, we pray this morning that that would be the echo of our hearts. Father, I continue to pray that that would be the the culture, the aroma, even the echo of Mount Carmel Baptist Church. That the legacy here would, 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 would tell stories and stories and stories of your faithfulness. But now pray and pray and pray and pray for more of your glory. Not only here and around East Tennessee, around our great country, but to the ends of the earth wherever you would allow us to take your fame, your gospel, your great grace, and your great mercy there. Use us in amazing ways. Build your church, not only here, but build your church around the world, all for your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus alone. Amen.